So good morning, everybody, and thanks a lot for uh, the introduction, and thanks uh, Raul and Laura for uh, organizing these two days. Uh, so indeed, what I'd like to uh, tell you about in here is uh, something related to many body localization, which is some form of ergodicity breaking that you have whenever you have some system which has strong disorder in it and which is quantum. So this talk is going to be a bit quantum, but since this is the stuff this day, I just wanted to start from uh, a picture of uh, Boltzmann here. And uh, the idea is that you can think about, I think this speaker is much easier. <laughs> so you can, uh, heavier but easier. So you can think about uh, this MBL as some mechanism that you have to uh, somehow escape from uh, a fate which is otherwise quite robust in such a system, which is the fate of converging to some uh, Boltzmann-like equilibrium. And uh, this mechanism is interesting in here because uh, to have it, you don't need to somehow uh, act on your system to keep it uh, out of equilibrium. So you don't need to drive it, you don't need to force it, you don't need to measure it directly. And so in this sense, this is quite similar to two other forms of uh, ergodicity breaking, which are very well studied in these uh, two labs, which are uh, quantum integrability on one hand and uh, glassiness that we heard about uh, on the other hand. So what I'd like to do in this talk is to comment a little bit uh, on the connection between these uh, different notions. And this was supposed to be the first part uh, of the talk, but I think it will actually be the whole talk. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to motivate is uh, this sentence in here. So the idea that if you think about MBL, you can think of it as uh, something which is in some sense both uh, integrable and glassy, but you have to be a bit precise about what you mean by this. So I try to uh, motivate this. And then at lunch, I can tell you <laughs> something more about this uh, work, which is more recent, where we go a bit more into detail uh, in discussing the connection between uh, localization and glassiness. But uh, let me start with uh, some introduction to these ideas of uh, MBL, and let me just mention what are the basic ingredients that you find uh, in all these models, which I think are essentially three. And the first one is uh, the fact that you're interested in here in a dynamics which is quantum, and in particular unitary. So, so you have a quantum system that you want to be isolated from the environment, so there is no thermal bath to which you couple your system. You prepare it into a state which is a pure state, so a vector, and you let it evolve with a dynamics which is just given by this uh, e to the minus ith, so the usual uh, unitary operator, which is a special dynamics in the sense that it preserves many things. So if your Hamiltonian is time independent, it preserves the total energy of your system. And in some sense, it also preserves the memory of your initial condition. And the reason is that you have a dynamics which is invertible. So whatever information you try to encode into your initial state, you know that it has to be there at any later time, because if you have the time evolved state, you know that by applying the unitary, the inverse unitary, you have to be able to trace back uh, your initial state unity. So there is no erasure of information under this uh, unitary dynamics. Now, therefore, everything here is fixed by the Hamiltonian, and the ingredient that you need in your Hamiltonian is this quench randomness. So one typical example is uh, this Hamiltonian that you see in here. So now I'm thinking about fermions on a finite dimensional lattice. Uh, and here is just a number operator, so it counts whether I have a fermion uh, on the site I of the lattice or not. And uh, the local field, which multiplies uh, the n, is my random variable. So I, I throw random variables at each site independently. I take them from a distribution, and the width is delta, so this measures uh, what are the fluctuations of this uh, homogeneity of, uh, of my local potential. And then I add some kinetic energy, so this is called the hopping term, which describes particles which can jump uh, from one side to another one. Now this is a quadratic Hamiltonian, so this is just a non-interacting problem. And now in order to be able to uh, talk about many body localization, you also have to add interactions uh, between these fermions. So what you can do is uh, to add density-density terms, like here where you have that fermions uh, see each other when they are at neighboring sites uh, in the lattice and uh, they don't uh, otherwise, so this is local in space. And uh, just below, I'm rewriting this Hamiltonian now in terms of spins, and uh, the reason is that in this literature you find uh, people jumping between these two formulations, and I will also do it uh, in the following, so particles of spin. But as soon as you are in 1D, this is totally innocent because you have transformations which allow you to map uh, one model into the other, so this is really equivalent. Okay, so given these ingredients, what do you call uh, MBL? So I don't think uh, we have 
a consensus about the definition of this uh, phenomenology, so I will give you my own and then uh, we can discuss. So what I would say is that you talk about uh, MDL whenever you have a system which is, uh, first of all, thermodynamically large, so you have in mind some thermodynamic limit because you want to speak about phases, dynamical phases in here. You have these quantum degrees of freedom, they interact, they have this uh, quant randomness, they evolve with these dynamics, and they do so in such a way that uh, they remain permanently and robustly out of thermal equilibrium, which is a notion that you have to define in this context of unitary dynamics, but let's say in word, it corresponds to the fact that you have a system which never serves as a heat bath for itself, so for any of its components. But uh, let's say to define this, you have to be precise, and the reason is that uh, so, so you can understand uh, why you have to make an effort here uh, by the fact that, so what would be the, the simplest uh, definition of thermalization in this context? Well, you would choose the object that defines uh, the state of your system, which is your density matrix. So I will just write it, yeah, so it would be like there, so your rho of T, this in this case is just a pure, sorry, your system is in a pure state, so this is just the projector onto the state of your system. And what you can ask is that this converges in some uh, long time limit to something which is Boltzmann-like, so which looks like e to the minus of h. Now this type of convergence can never be true under unitary dynamics, and the reason is that if you start from a pure state, you will always be in a pure state, so there is no way you can end up uh, in a mixture like this. So you have to come up with a definition which is a bit weaker. And uh, the way you do this here is to introduce some notion of uh, locality, for example, in space. So this is sketched in here. The idea is that you have your big box, which is your big system. And then what you want to do is you focus on arbitrary subsystems. You look at observables, so operators which act on the degrees of freedom of your subsystem. And uh, you look at the expectation value, so one point function in time, so the expectation value of these operators on the time evolving state, so uh, on this density matrix. And then what you ask is that this one point function in some large time limit, when you send uh, the size of your system to infinity, converge to something that you can describe uh, and which coincides with the expectation value of the same operator that you would get against some uh, Boltzmann-like measure, where you have to fix this inverse temperature beta, and the way you do this is uh, by using the fact that the energy is conserved in your system, so each energy density that you have corresponds thermodynamically to some temperature, so you basically impose this equation for the Hamiltonian itself, and this gives you an equation for beta that you solve, and then once you have beta, you ask that the same type of convergence holds with the same beta for all of your local observables. And the picture is, of course, that uh, during time evolution, your full system will converge to something very complicated, a pure state, but at least if you probe it uh, locally in this sense, you have some temperature which emerges and you can introduce some uh, Boltzmann-like description. So what happens is that during time evolution, this subsystem will exchange energy particles with the rest of the system and the rest of the system essentially acts as a bath for the subsystem. So this happens uh, often, but uh, this is what breaks down uh, when you have MDL. So in this uh, type of setting, you, sh you see that there is no way you can introduce some well-defined notion of temperature, and also there is no point for you then in, in computing these partition functions. So uh, the type of ergodicity breaking you're thinking about here is not something which is related to symmetry breaking that you see when computing a partition function. So in this sense, it's already a bit different with respect to, to static transitions in glasses that you can probe, uh, of course, uh, with uh, thermodynamics. It is more similar to uh, dynamical glass transitions. And also it is more similar to, uh, to quantum integrability, but there are these uh, crucial differences in these two words. So the first word is permanent, and uh, the idea is that uh, we expect that uh, this phase is, is not a metastable phase uh, in here, as it happens for the dynamical glass transition when you go beyond a uh, mean field, for example. So it's not the case that if you wait maybe a parametrically large time scale, you will eventually see uh, that the system thermalizes. Now in this case, you expect that this, uh, let's say, out of thermal equilibrium physics goes on forever, of course, provided that you keep your system isolated, which you cannot forever, but uh, let's say ideally uh, this would be the case. And moreover, this is robust. So what I mean is that you can change a bit the couplings of your Hamiltonian, you change your disorder realization, you make the disorder a bit weaker, a bit stronger, and you still have this 
uh, phase appearing, which is very different with respect to usual integrable systems where to have better answers or uh, solvability, you need to be uh, precisely at an integrable point. So this is why I, I'm speaking about phases uh, in here, dynamical phases. Of course, there is a boundary, so if you make the disorder too weak, then eventually you will break down this physics and you will transition to, uh, to some delocalized phase. So you see there are differences between MBL and glasses and uh, integrable systems. And uh, let me just mention uh, where do these differences come from? Well, they come from the fact that the physics behind is different because here we have localization. And localization means essentially that you have uh, very weak uh, or very inefficient transport uh, in your system. And this is something you can make precise. So you look at constant quantities like the energy or charge if you have electrons. You compute transport coefficients associated with them, so let's say a conductivity. The, you're interested in the dissipative part of your conductivity, so you can write down uh, expressions in linear response. And uh, the statement here is that uh, the, the zero frequency component of this uh, conductivity goes to zero when you are uh, in the localized phase. So now this is something that at the level of single particles you can actually prove uh, rigorously. Uh, so if you have no interactions, and the ingredient that you use uh, to prove this is uh, the peculiar structure in real space of the eigenfunctions of your um, uh, Anderson Hamiltonian, so uh, what I call here phi alpha, because what you can show is that when you have a strong enough disorder, this phi alpha have a profile which looks like this, so they have this, exponential locali they have this exponentially decaying uh, tail, which is really a signature of Anderson localization, and if you use this ingredient, you can really make statements uh, about conductivity vanishing. Now, if you go to the many-body case, you, you do not have such theorems, but you can still argue uh, that this is the case, and this is this very important work by Vasquez and uh, Schuller, uh, which actually builds on the same formalism which was introduced already by Anderson uh, in 58. So this is the work which gave birth to, uh, to the whole business of uh, localization. And uh, what they do in here is essentially to do diagrammatics. So they look at uh, self-energies of local excitations. They uh, write down the diagrammatic expansion for these self-energies to all order in the interactions, and then they do some statistical analysis on the weights uh, of these diagrams, and based on this, uh, they claim that there is no transport uh, in the system. Okay, so how is this uh, then related to integrability, given that there is this uh, fundamental difference in, in the physics behind? Well, the point of connection is in the fact that in here, as well as in clean integrable systems, you also have many conservation laws. So you can show that MBL system admit uh, a complete and extensive set of operators, which I call I alpha, which are conserved in the sense that they commute uh, with a many body Hamiltonian. They are also independent, so they commute uh, with themselves. And they are responsible for really constraining your unitary dynamics. And uh, because you have them, you have no convergence to uh, something as simple as, uh, as a Boltzmann metric. Now, there are differences. So, so the, there is something which encodes for the physics of MBL in these conserved quantities. And this is something that you see if you ask, what is the structure in space of these operators? So what you can do is you take such a quantity and you ask, uh, what is the profile of the norm of the operator in my lattice, so in real space? And what you realize is that this quantity have this peculiar uh, exponentially localized uh, structure, so very similar to uh, the single particle wave function uh, of the problem without interactions, uh, which means that this operator will act <coughs> significantly only on the degrees of freedom which are in some compact finite region of your lattice, which is, let's say, around some localization center and of a typical width that we call a localization length. And beyond this typical width, they decay exponentially fast. So you can essentially associate each of these operators to some finite bunch of sites, and you know that the operator essentially, to first approximation, acts only on those sites, which is a structure which is very different from the one of, uh, let me just finish the sentence. So if you ask about conserved quantities in clean integrable system, the structure is very different. So you don't have this localization property. You would have that the quantities are still local but in the same way as the Hamiltonian itself is local. So it's a sum of local densities which involves all of the sites uh, that you have in your lattice. Please? I'm asking about at least a reference where I can see. It's coming in the next slide. 
Okay. Because it's never given explicitly, so people talk about that for 15 years, but these operators are never shown. A bit less than 15 years, let's say. Okay, they started. Okay, <laughs> maybe less, but, but operators but are never shown. But wait for, uh, for the next slides. First, let me s uh, tell you what is a second property which follows from this. So this set is complete. So this means that you can write down the Hamiltonian as a function along these operators. And you will find something which looks like this. So this is like a classical modus, which just depends on these degrees of freedom with all higher order terms. And uh, this exponential structure is something that you trace back in, in the structure of these couplings, because what you can argue is that also these couplings decay exponentially in the distance between, if you want, the localization center of the corresponding operators which appear in, uh, in the products uh, that you're looking at. Okay, so what are the references? So this is, uh, these are some of those references. Of course, there has been a lot of works on MBL from the point of view of integrability. It started around uh, 2013, 2014, and then, uh, so these were papers where somehow people were suggesting this idea of uh, conserved quantities that should exist. Then uh, there has been a lot of work on uh, constructing them explicitly. So I give you one Hamilton and I give you a realization of disorder and you tell me uh, what are these quantities. There are many schemes. So there is also work by C.C. Uh, Montes here uh, at UPHT. And, uh, and why is it not obvious how to build them? Well, the idea is that uh, you don't have like in integrability monodromy matrices around which you take derivatives and, and you have a recipe to build them. So here, uh, for each disorder realization, in principle, you have a different set of operators. So you really have to come up with, uh, with a prescription. So we also did something on this and I will uh, maybe spend a few minutes uh, to tell you uh, our idea. And then there is some work uh, which is, uh, let's say, rigorous by John Imbri, which does not build explicitly this quantity, but somehow this work implies uh, the existence of this quantity with this particular local structure. So what he does is to prove some locality property of the unitary operator which diagonalizes the Hamiltonian that he's looking at. So if you want detail, we can uh, discuss more about this. Shaking head, Mitchell, do you want to? <laughs> people discuss, yeah, indeed, that construction where the, uh, and every time you ask, you look, uh, I, I, the commutation rule doesn't work, you say, okay, it's, a, it's an approximate thing. No, okay, so let me tell, and it's going to yeah, be again yeah. an approximate thing, but yeah. let me tell you as an example what we did in, in this work, just to be a bit more uh, concrete. So what is the idea? So uh, you don't have a recipe to build them explicitly, as I said, but you kind of understand what you, you expect these quantities to be, and the idea is that uh, you kind of expect that if you have interactions uh, which are at least uh, weak enough, your conserved operator, so what I call I alpha, should be some weak and local deformation of those conserved quantities that you have in absence of these scattering processes, so in absence of interactions. And these conserved quantities are just the occupation numbers of your single particle uh, Hamiltonians, uh, which are of course con conserved, so if we kill you then these operators commute with the Hamiltonian itself. Uh, and they are also, they also have this exponential localized structure in space because this is inherited from the exponential localization of the single particle wave function, which is something you can prove uh, when this order is strong enough. And so the idea is that when you switch on uh, the interaction, in some sense, you have some sort of adiabatic uh, continuation, a bit like Landau and quasi-particles at the Deferme surface. So you can map uh, or connect uh, each of these I alpha to uh, one of the unperturbed uh, local uh, operator N alpha. And uh, the way you build this uh, a bit more uh, explicitly is by writing down some operator expansion. So you say I alpha should be N alpha plus some dressing which comes from the interactions, which you write as this uh, sum over all possible strings of creation and annihilation of single particle uh, excitations. These strings have arbitrary length, so you sum over uh, almost all of them, then you have to put some uh, restrictions to define uniquely uh, these operators. And then you have amplitudes, which you have to fix in order to, uh, to fix the operator itself. Now, how do you fix this? Well, of course, what you do is you impose uh, that this operator is conserved, so you write down the commutation uh, requirement uh, with a many-body Hamiltonian, you set it to zero, 
and you project in such a way that you get equations for these uh, for these amplitudes. And what you find is that these equations are linear, and uh, they look very similar to uh, Schrodinger-like uh, equations for some effective uh, single particle problem. So you can look at this amplitude, and you can kind of interpret it as the amplitude of a wave function, which is labeled by alpha, at a site i and j. So i and j are index sets which collects all the single particle excitations uh, which correspond to your uh, term in the operator expansion. And uh, therefore, you can identify each operator with a site and a lattice, and this is why we call this a localization problem on an operator uh, lattice. And what you want to show is that this effective single particle problem is itself Anderson localized. So you want to impose some bound or show that there are bounds which are exponential uh, to these uh, amplitudes, to these coefficients. And uh, what we are able to do within an approximation, which is uh, the so-called forward approximation, is to show that indeed uh, these bounds uh, occur in probability asymptotically in the length of these uh, strings uh, of excitations. And if you have these bounds, you have then that this type of expansion converges in norm to some operator. And you have that the operator that you are constructing has some sort of uh, locality uh, properties, so those that you want. So here it looks like uh, exponential decay on this fictitious lattice, but actually the idea is that you can convert it into a statement about uh, localization in, in real space because uh, the, the, the longer you make these strings of excitation, the more you need to go uh, further and further away in space because your single particle states are localized, so there will be only a finite number of them in a given volume, and if you want to create more and more, you have to go further and further away. The original problem or the, the yes. No, the, in the original problem we work, uh, let's say, in arbitrary dimension, but we need to have this order strong enough so that the non-interacting limit is localized. So in one dimension this is guaranteed wh by whatever disorder. In higher dimension you have uh, a transition. And then we build on that. Uh, but at the level of our approximation dimension really will enter really as a parameter in, in, the, uh, in the calculation. I mean, it counts how many of these terms uh, you have in the expansion because if you are in higher dimension, you have more, let's say, excitations that you can create because you can move in space uh, more freely. So you use the PD domain and the forward approximation? Yes, so the forward approximation, so, so first of all, what is uh, basically this A? Well, this is a probability amplitude for a scattering process. So you, let's say this, whenever you have an operator in here, you, you, you have a string of excitations that you are uh, creating. So this corresponds to, if you, you can visualize it diagrammatically, it's, uh, you, you start from, uh, let's say, your excitation alpha around which you perturb, and then you have a first interaction which gives you three states, and then you act again with your, so this is an interaction matrix element, then you act again, and so on and so forth. And uh, you can have, uh, let's say, the amplitude there tells you what is the amplitude of this type of diagram. And in these diagrams, you can have, uh, let's say, different situations. So you can have diagrams like this or diagrams which are tree-like in the sense that somehow you, you never repeat indices uh, in your interaction matrix element. And the forward approximation corresponds to neglecting uh, this type of processes. It's a tree, it's a, it's a new field-like. Uh, approximation, and it is what you assume that, it, or you think it is. Uh, these are the diagrams which matter, because sometimes, uh, somehow, if you always explore new indices, you have a phase space term associated to this process which is larger uh, than this, and so it parametrically you expect that these are uh, more important. Okay, and now I, I will maybe give a picture now that makes it uh, just easier to see uh, pictorially if you think about the um, operator lattice, so the effective problem. So let me just uh, give it, and, and I will just mention connection to glassiness, and then maybe uh, that's already time. So what does it mean to, to address this problem within this forward approximation? So, so first of all, you have to specify or to understand what is the lattice, uh, which corresponds to this effective single particle problem. So. At the level of your original problem, the, the topology of the lattice is fixed by the interaction 
matrix element of your uh, many body problem types. And uh, what you find is that if you work within this uh, approximation, this operator lattice looks a little bit like uh, a beta lattice, as you see in here. So it's not exactly a beta lattice. You have loops uh, which uh, connect uh, the root, which corresponds to the operator around which you are perturbing with whatever uh, other site. But uh, let's say you have this hierarchical structure, so you can organize, if you want, longer and longer operators in two generations in this lattice. And uh, the interaction will always allow you to go from one generation to the next. Or in principle, it would allow you to go from one side of the generation to another side of the same generation. But this corresponds precisely to this type of processes uh, that we are neglecting. So uh, if we throw away those processes uh, with the motivation that I, I tried to sketch, you end up with something which, uh, which looks like this. And uh, what you can also show is that this amplitude uh, have a very simple uh, expression. So the amplitude uh, at a site ij here is nothing but the sum over all paths which are directed in the lattice, which connect the root to the given site of an amplitude associated to each path, which is, as you see, the product of uh, terms which depend on the site, which are encountered along the path. And these terms are ratio of energies. So you have a denominator, uh, a matrix element of the interaction. At the denominator, you have uh, linear combinations of the energies of the single particle states, which are uh, involved uh, in these interaction matrix elements. Now, if you uh, just to come back to this uh, forward approximation, so you see that essentially it's also, if you want, a linear order, um, largest order appro approximation in the interaction. So the uh, let's say that you have many possible scattering processes which bring you to the final state, which is encoded in here, and you consider only the directed path, which is the lowest order in this uh, interaction. Otherwise, you could make excursion, go to some other side, come back, and go down, but this would be higher order than you. So you can think of this also as, uh, as a lower order approximation in the interaction uh, for each side. Okay, so, so to, to conclude, I, I wanted to show this because many people here would look at this and they would immediately recognize uh, something which looks a little bit like a partition function. And uh, in particular, a partition function on, uh, on something which looks a little bit like a beta lattice. And so one would be tempted, and indeed uh, this is what people do, to make a connection to the so-called problem of uh, directed polymers in, uh, on the beta lattice uh, in random media which is uh, a very nice uh, problem in statistical physics, which we, we know to have a glass transition. So uh, this is a problem where what you want to do is to compute the partition function of a classical system, which is defined on a beta lattice. And this is the sum over all path from the root of the lattice to some uh, boundary, so perhaps infinity, of the weight of each path, which is again the product of Boltzmann-like weights associated to each site where the energy in here, which you put at each site, is an independent random variable. And now this problem is something which proves uh, very nicely solved uh, in this work, and we know that uh, it has a glass transition, so we know that there is a critical temperature, and that if you are above this critical temperature, your problem is liquid, which here means that uh, you have a finite entropy which contributes uh, to this partition function, so you have an exponentially large number of paths which uh, contribute on the same ground to, uh, to the Boltzmann measure. But if you go below this uh, critical temperature, this uh, entropy freezes to zero. So uh, this tells you that your Boltzmann measure is dominated by a sub-exponential number of terms, and this is what you call freezing or glassy or, or perhaps condensation if you think about uh, the fact that you have only few terms which, uh, on which all of the weight of your partition function is going. So now given this analogy, and this I will uh, really finish, uh, it's, it's very tempting then to go back to your localization problem and ask, uh, are we liquid or are we glassy when, we are, uh, when this expansion makes sense and it is convergent? And not surprisingly, what you find is that your uh, localized problem is always in the, in the glassy phase of the underlying directed polymer. So you have uh, that this path which contribute to your, let's say, partition function, if you interpret it in this language, uh, they have a distribution. This is, again, within the approximation that we are uh, using, which, is, uh, which has fat tail, so it's Cauchy-like. It's like uh, what we saw uh, a few talks ago. Uh, 
Uh, and this means that uh, somehow the sum will be always dominated by few terms. So let me say one term, which is the largest one, which takes uh, essentially all of, the, all of the weight. And this glassy phase is not true only in the strongly localized phase, but it remains true up to the transition point to delocalization. So the transition to delocalization where all the construction breaks down, uh, it's, it's not the same as the glass transition. You are still glassy, but what happens is that this dominating path uh, the disorder is weak enough so that this becomes uh, itself of the order of one, and this is what signals the fact that your uh, expansion does not converge anymore, and at the, at the physical level is telling you that you have the dominating path, so the term which dominates, if you want the ground, okay, the, 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 the state which dominates your partition function, or the few path which dominate your partition function, that for me, uh, is this, so it's a sum over uh, path in these two tissue glasses. There will be few paths which dominate and the amplitude of this path becomes of the order of one. So they are no longer exponentially small, which is what you need to have localization, but they become order one. But they are still sub-exponentially many. So in principle, you are summing still over exponentially many terms, but few of those dominate. So you will, uh, Uh, and those are the ones that drive uh, the transition to delocalization. Uh, so this is just to, uh, to say that somehow the two transitions uh, are different and whenever you are uh, localized, you are always within this uh, glassy phase of the underlying uh, glassy polymer. But again, this is uh, approximate, so it tells you something about uh, the nature of this transition, but you would like to go beyond that. And, and I think that understanding this transition beyond this, and in general understanding this transition from localization to delocalization, theoretically is one of the uh, questions which is perhaps more interesting in this uh, field of, uh, of MDL, and which is also uh, pretty open uh, at the moment. And so this was a question that was a bit motivating this uh, work, which I will not tell you about, <laughs> but I will just perhaps uh, give you a, um, a teaser, and the teaser is that uh, what we do, so we wanted to understand more uh, this transition. We wanted to set up some sort of self-consistent way to describe localized and delocalized uh, phases. And uh, to do this, we add to our system some other degrees of freedom, which we allow to fluctuate uh, a little bit faster, and which we treat uh, either as quenched in our calculation or as an yield, and we want to compare uh, how things change. And I will just tell you that if we play with this uh, additional degrees of freedom, we uh, have a phenomenology which is a bit richer in the, uh, in the localized phase. And in particular, we see that we can switch uh, the order of these uh, two transitions. So the glassy transition of the underlying polymer and the uh, transition to a delocalized phase. Uh, and we have an intermediate phase uh, within localization where the underlying directed polymer is, uh, is no longer frozen. Uh, and this is really uh, due to the fact that uh, we allow somehow this uh, extra degrees of freedom to uh, have an interplay with the quench disorder and to, uh, and to help to unfreeze uh, the underlying polymer. So this at least gives you a flavor of the fact that, uh, uh, yes, localization is glassy, but these are really different notions and you can uh, somehow switch uh, between them and uh, analyze uh, a bit more in detail what is the interplay between uh, these two different problems. And with that, I think it's time to stop. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for this very enlightening talk. For me, it was the first time I understood this kind of uh, topic. I knew the acronyms very well, but never understood it. Today, I think I really learned a lot. Um, any questions? Everybody is hungry, but still we have time for a, a couple of questions. I can't. Uh, how important is it that you work with fermions rather than with bosons here well at the single particle level you know <laughs> of course uh, in the many body well of course okay if you go to lower temperature you don't want that uh, I mean if you have bosons you can have 
many bosons on the same side, so the spots where this order is weaker will uh, attract all of the bosons. So if you are at low temperature, you will have this phenomena of uh, condensation in regions of space and instabilities due to that that you don't want it. So that is why you go to Fermi. But since MBL is something that doesn't require you to, to be at low temperature, so you can take highly excited state as an initial condition and look at the dynamics. There you can also put boson. You start with initial conditions which are, uh, let's say, at half filling, but with, a, let's say, a distribution of boson which is very inhomogeneous. And this gives you some sort of effective additional randomness and you can study phenomena of localization. Uh, sometimes, I mean, people discuss also localization without disorder in the bosonic case at high temperature using the, if you want, landscape generated by the other bosons as some sort of uh, effective random landscape, a bit like a real day in some sense. I mean, glasses without disorder. So your I alpha, could, do they commute or do they have some properties like that? Sorry. Uh, you conserve quantity. Ah, no, absolutely they commute. And they, you can really understand them. Okay, so, so I mentioned this mathematical work by, by John Imri. And the idea is that he works with uh, spins. Uh, so, but it's equivalent, so let's. Okay, so, so le let me work again with fermions. So we have the unperturbed, uh, let's say, number operators. And the idea is that, so you have your initial Hamiltonian in this basis of single particle states with a, quadra with a quartic term which corresponds to interaction. And uh, what you ask is, well, you can diagonalize so in principle, you, you will have an unitary operator that allows you to diagonalize uh, your Hamiltonian and that brings it into a form which is just a functional of this quantity. Or that you invert would be just a, a functional, uh, higher order functional of products of these quantities. And uh, this unitary operator which diagonalizes your Hamiltonian is something which um, he calls quasi-local, so this means that the generator of the unitary has some local structure, so you basically kind of preserve locality when you apply this unitary. And the way you think about this I alpha is as u dagger and alpha u, and then you have all the algebra. Yeah. You can do it with this u dagger c and you have all the same algebra. Any other question? Just yeah. to comment that you have fermions matters when you do diagrammatic, you have signs uh, and so on, that's true. But uh, yeah, yes, it would, it would be much more. Maybe I had a slightly technical question on your, same on your seventh uh, transparency. You're defining a, a length psi, yes. which shows how the A decay. Uh, yeah. The seventh one? Uh, Oops. Ah, okay. So it's a uh, ah, this one. Yes, so this the psi here is uniform in alpha. Um, and is it related to the localization length of the underlying Anderson model or not? Um, yes, it is. Um, it's uniform in alpha because when you look at this in probability, you kind of erase all dependence. So is it the same the as the localization on alpha? So you have a bound, I mean, yeah, it's a bound, yeah. within approximation, you find that there exists a Z which is uh, smaller than uh, Zeta, yeah. something such that you can uh, pose this bound. And then uh, you can, uh, I mean, when this probability uh, is of order one, you choose the smallest uh, yes. Z, and this gives information on the localization length of this, uh, of okay. this operator. And is it related to the one uh, which you have? On it the is a, a function of the one, so it's, it's a bit implicit, so I, I should. Uh, but it diverges when you reach a transition, for example? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So okay. It's a bit implicit. So the w the localization of that enters in the connectivity of this lattice okay. because to understand for a scattering process how many states you can create, this is related to localization length because the density of single particle state that you have in a given region of space depends on the localization length. So this will enter into the connectivity of this lattice, and when the connectivity goes to infinity, you are not localized anymore. Okay. So. Yeah, so you can it's a bit implicit, but uh, yes, it's there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we can thank Valentina and all the thanks. <laughs>Yes, just before going to lunch, I wanted to thank um, all the speakers of today and uh, also the other day for participating to this uh, little conference. 
uh, to all of you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the talks. And I also want to thank uh, Maxime uh, Leroy for helping us uh, with setting uh, all the room. Laure Sabois, who helped uh, um, uh, with the buffet, she's not here, but she And Valentina Ross also, who helped <laughs> us uh, in uh, LPTMS <laughs> for um, the technological side. <laughs> and okay, let's go to lunch then. <laughs>